Good day to everyone. I'm Mark Bauman, the coordinator of music ministries here at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. We're about to start a project with the pipe organ here at the church. And since many people don't have the opportunity right now to be in the church and see what's going on, I thought it would be nice to give you a glimpse of what will be happening starting in the month of January. So, um, and what we're doing is the organ is going to get a bit of refurbishment. It's not going to be a brand new organ. The organ was inspected and was deemed in very good condition, just needs a little love and care and TLC so it can move on for ministry in the future. And as we go along today in this little video, we'll show you some things and discuss what's going to happen. The company that is going to work on the organ is the Dobson Organ Company, which is in Lake City, Iowa. They have a reputation known all over the globe. So mighty and wonderful things happen in the state of Iowa. One of the last projects that they recently finished was a brand new organ for St. Thomas Church on Fifth Avenue in New York City, a rather large and fabulous instrument. And they've done lots of work in the Midwest and around the country and in other places around the globe. And we're very excited that they will be here to do wonderful things for the instrument here at St. Paul's. And our next moving on, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of how the organ has moved around and been in place here at the church. Theology at St. Paul's Methodist Church has always been of prime focus. And when this building was built, preaching and music were most vital in that design. And when the church was first built, the preacher was in this similar position with the pulpit. The choir and the organ and the organ chamber of pipes were far above from where they are today. They were high up into the tower and the choir sat above the preacher. The organist and the organ console were also in that position. And they stayed there and the organ pipes as well were up above that high into the tower. Then, as the choir got larger, because there was not a lot of room in that space, and there is a picture in your St. Paul's history book that shows the way the church was when it was built, and there are people who still can remember that situation. The choir grew, and it was no longer feasible to do things that way. And so in the 1950s, the organ was reworked some. The chamber stayed in place. The organ console moved down to its present location on the one side of the sanctuary and the choir as well went down into that place. And that's where it remains today. It is not the same console, not the same choir, and it works very well for worship and music and theology at St. Paul's to the current time. At the 50s, the organ started to have problems in the late 50s and into the 60s and into the 70s. And in the mid 70s, a project was done to work on the organ again. The uh, Sipe Company from Dallas, Texas, who also built the organ that is now in place at Luther College in the Center for Faith and Life, was the contracted company, did some wonderful work with the organ, and that is the basic instrument that is serving St. Paul's to this day. And so it is now time for the Dobson Company to do their wonderful magic and engineering to work on the organ so that music, theology, and ministry will continue far past today. Part of the project will include working on the organ console here. Now this is the side of the organ that you don't get to see because it's all boxed in. You see the other side with the keys. This is the inside of an organ console. So here are the back side of the keys, like the back side of a piano. The organ pedal back sides are down here. There are a lot of computer chips and computer boards. There is lots of wiring. Over to the far sides over here are the controls where we activate certain kinds of sounds for the organ to play and so on and so forth. The Dobson Company will be in here checking all the wiring, making sure all the pneumatic parts of it 
work correctly, if there's a broken piece of plastic that's not helping something function right, it'll get replaced so that everything in this console will be up to snuff and doing what it needs to do for music and ministry. You are now inside the pipe chamber of the organ at St. Paul's. So where I'm standing right now in 1913 was the area where the choir sat and that um, the organist also sat up here, the console was here, and these people entered from a door or two from the hallway. And the choir was small then, maybe only about eight to 12 singers. In the 1930s and 40s, the choir grew and in the 1950s, the organ was worked on somewhat. The console was moved down to its present location, which I mentioned before, and the choir. So this area became vacant. In the 1970s, when the organ was worked, this area got refurbished. The walls were plastered well, well for Sound of Music. The floor was redone, and the pipes were moved down to this level from up above. There are pipes in this chamber that still date from the organ of 1913, and they are still in wonderful condition. There are many organs around the globe that are much older than this one, and they are still playing. All they just need is a lot of love and care. I'm going to go up high into the chamber right now so you get a glimpse up there too. As I climb the ladder through the various parts of the organ, there are pipes all in rows for the notes, there are some along the walls, and there are three levels of pipes here. I have climbed past the first one. I'm coming up to the very top here on this nice dirty ladder that was built in the 1970s, and I'm at the top level. Um, I am touching a pipe right now that comes from the organ of 1913. There are some pipes from 1913 in here. There's some pipes from the 1929 working by the Austin Company of Hartford, Connecticut. That was the original builder. And there are pipes here from the 1970s. The pipes from the 50s had all disappeared with the reworking of the time in the 1970s. But there are metal pipes, there are wooden pipes, and there are all different types of construction to make the different sounds that the organ can do in wonderful ways, and that's very exciting. Um, also inside the chamber are all the duct work that brings air to let the pipes speak. The air actually enters the chamber over here from a blower that's installed across the hallway and comes over the ceiling of the hallway and brings the air into the chamber here for the power was to the organ was on, you'd hear a lot of hissing in here because there would be a lot of pressurized air being readied for when notes are played that the air rushes into the pipe and lets it speak very much like someone playing a flute or a clarinet or a bassoon or another instrument. And that would be how the organ works in a very simple terms there. So the organ company, when they come here in January, are going to remove almost all of these pipes. They will be going into a truck in special containers, going to Lake City where they will work on each pipe individually. They will make sure there are no dents that shouldn't be there, clean them. They will clean the inside of this chamber, make sure all of the ductwork, all of the wiring, all the computering, devices in here are up to snuff. There are some pipes that they are going to rework rather significantly at the shop in Lake City to bring the organ into a better state or a different state as well from what it was in the 1970s. It probably won't make much difference to anyone's ears. It'll make a difference to the musician's ears, but it will bring about a much better result for everyone so that the organ is very stable and does what it needs to do all the time for all the players for now and into the future. I hope you had fun on this little excursion, getting to see the inside of the organ console, the pipe chamber, and get to a little, little bit about how things work. In 1913, when the first organ was put in at St. Paul's, it cost a little more than $5,000. Uh, for the past several centuries, 
we've terminized the cost of an organ by farmland. And the cost of an organ usually has been about 60 acres. The organ at St. Paul's in 1913 cost a little less than 60 acres. In 2021, we're going to spend $70,000 for its refurbishment. As the cost of farmland goes now, we're going to spend a little more than the cost of nine acres. So it's a very exciting project. It will help inspire us to acts and ministry of faith and love, charity, hospitality as we move forward farther into this century and may you all have a blessed time and I'll leave you today with a little bit of music from the organ. Well, if you're like me, you've just learned a whole lot more about the organ here at St. Paul's, things that I sure didn't know. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Mark Bauman for his narration and the guided tour and a history lesson. You know, we're really appreciative of the partnership with our trustees and Mark's leadership for our music department. Uh, we, we sure invite you, if this, is, if this is a ministry that's near and dear to your heart, um, feel free to, to give any financial gift that you would like to help support this work. Uh, and that allows us to free up funds for additional uh, upkeep and, and repairs uh, in this beautiful historic sanctuary. The ministries of music and the ministries of arts allow us to express our faith in unique and creative ways. The ministries of music and art touch our hearts in unique ways. And so it is our hope here at St. Paul's to continue for many, many years into the future, inviting creative expressions of faith through music and the arts. Thank you for being a part of this tour. May God bless you, and we look forward to showing you the finished results in a few months.